Today, this, this is our, this is number eight in nine different webinars that we have brought to you in this series. So this uh, series was kind of this great idea that got even bigger. Each week over the past three weeks, we've had a different phase. And I'll go through those and just recap in a little bit. But today, my guest is Diego Rodriguez, who is the principal and owner of Lurod Financial Group, LLC. My name is Audra Lavoy. I'm an alumni career advisor with the University of Rhode Island Foundation and alumni engagement. So what we're talking about, entrepreneurship is this, it's an exciting thing. There's so many pieces to it, but it also can feel intimidating. So what we're talking about really has to do with access. This whole series was brought out of the idea of, we want you to feel like this is doable. If you have an interest, if you have a desire, if you have a thought in the back of your head, we wanna give you the space to, to think these things through, give you some materials, and then give you some resources that support you. So this might be, you might've always thought of a part-time or a full-time thing. You might think that I want a huge business and it's gonna be brick and mortar and there's gonna be a lot of costs to start up, or I'm really thinking of doing something that would be much more based off of what I already have for time and talents. Ultimately, it's about what works for you. Rules of the road for this session. We will stay on time. Uh, then sessions will be recorded. We record all of them. I'll send a note to everybody tomorrow with the recording as well as any links, anything that Diego says while we speak, I'll try to capture it and share that. Um, at any point, this is really driven by you. Your questions are the things that are the most important. You can use Q&A or you can use the chat feature, put those in. And then our disclaimer is, this is all about Diego's experience. It is anecdotal. It is not to be meant to be a one-on-one -on -one advising session. And who is Diego? <laughs> so Diego is one of our alumni, just like everyone else in this series, two-time alum, coming for BS in accounting and MS in accounting, and then MS specifically in taxation from Bryant University. He has an interesting blend of working in finance in a few different areas. I mentioned EY and Covidian. When we spoke before, you'd also mentioned Schneider Electric. So kind of this overall piece. And then a volunteer for VITA that's volunteers in taxation. Okay. <laughs> Board of Treasurer at Dorcas International. I have a particular soft spot for that. That is an organization I used to work for. I know they do really good work, so it's always nice to, to have multiple connections. And then board member of Providence Redevelopment Agency. Everyone I speak to, we have all these kind of pre-conversations. So this series for you all might be a lot just because we're throwing tons of information at you. But for us too, on the back end, Diego and I have spoken multiple times. He has had the chance to look at these slides. We've had multiple touch points. And I wanna stress that, that these are, everyone's really generous with their time and we're very lucky to have everyone who, who's kindly given to it. In our first conversation, when Diego and I were talking, some of the things that struck me, and I, I think about this a lot in my mind is, because every alum is so different, his business is different than everyone else's that we've spoken to. He's a different person. Some of the themes that I was hearing is really being somebody who's intentional, reflective, and then community-centered. So these, these are the personality traits we're gonna benefit from today. Diego, any other highlights you wanna add in? No, I just wanna start out by saying thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure for me to come back and give back to the university that I'm proud to be an alum of, and I'm excited to jump in. So jumping in, phase one was all about ideation. This was all about the bubbling, the thinking. We kind of framed it out saying, hey, let's look at the types of business. Let's look at you. What is right for you? So what do you already have in your corner being your own industry knowledge, your own talents or skill sets? If there's a network you're already tied into and then doing a lot more self-assessment, things that we were stressing with this grouping of, of uh, webinars have to do with surround yourself with the right people. You know, when you wanna keep this idea energized and start moving it forward, you wanna be around other entrepreneurs that can be a really great resource. 
as well as being realistic with what your idea is. Number two was packed, phase two, so last week was packed with resources. So it's great to have these ideas. We are so lucky to be in a time and a place where there are lots of great resources here to assist you. I think when we talk about access, something like starting a business can sound intimidating, but if you are taking advantage of mentor networks, if you're taking advantage of these free services that are right around us, about being around other, other entrepreneurs and people who are striving to be an entrepreneur, you can find a lot of great information. And then this is what I wanna ask Diego about. So last night we started talking logistics. This is, this is like the thing that people teach whole courses on. So we are going through very fast. We're not, we're not giving it um, really the attention it needs, but I want you to have the right questions to ask as you go through your, your uh, experience. So some of them were talking about some basic steps of registering the business name, getting a federal tax. These, like I said, I'll send them out to you. There's links to all these. Having a question of whether I need a license or a permit really depends on the business. Where I want to take a step back and why I wanted to introduce Diego earlier is going into the professionals and going into the business structure. So when we talked about business structure yesterday, this in itself is, it is a big decision. And, um, you know, Diego and I were speaking this morning and, you know, there's certain things that may feel like your default, like LLCs are really common, common, especially for someone who is starting a business, you wanna give it that legitimacy, but you know, you know it's not at a stage uh, we talked about there is there is the ability to move between. So if I start at one, we can move and but there's tax impact when I do that. So I want to have a full conversation. One of the great things Diego said this morning is if I look at these business structures, I really want to understand what it's used for and to maximize this. Diego, can you give us a slow walk through if I'm a sole proprietor versus partnership, when is which one best for me in my business? Yep. And, and it's a good conversation to have as well because there's a lot of, like we talked about, very different ramifications. And like we talked about, you know, you don't want to hear it depends because that's too vague. So if we use an example of like a virtual assistant, right? So let's say, for example, you want to be a sole proprietor. You want to be able to have the flexibility of working from home and you want to manage two or three clients. <clears throat> so a sole proprietor makes the most sense, right? Because you don't really have a lot of liability to worry about. Um, the taxes are very simple. So it's something that is very easy to set up and get going from day one. Now, let's say, for example, this, you know, you're very popular and very good at what you do. And now you have, you know, more clients than what you can take on. So now your business has grown, which is a good thing. And you can think about, well, how do I want to continue to grow and shape my business? One way it could be you can bring on a partner and go the partnership route, right? The other thing is you have also um, versatile entity types. So you go into the LLC, for example, right? An LLC can be taxed as a sole proprietor, as a partnership, or as a um, C corporation. So because of the, that flexibility, you're able to, um, to graduate, you can say, depending on what form the business takes. So you, you would say, all right, I'm gonna start out as a sole proprietor. You found someone that you, know, you get along with very well, you, you drive great, you think you wanted to be a partnership together. Well, you can go from a sole proprietor and say, all right, this person is gonna buy in for 50% of the business, and then you go and form a partnership, right? And let's say the business continues to grow and you continue to get more demand, and you're like, you know, we should really hire employees and we should get some more systems in place and technology. And, you know, over the holidays, you talk to a relative of yours and says, you know what, I want to back you as a shareholder. So there you can say, all right, maybe a partnership doesn't work anymore because we can't have shareholders. Now we can go the C corp or the S corp route, depending on what's more beneficial. So it really depends on the type of business that you're running and where it's going. Now, let's say, for example, in another, in another form, 
let's say you want to start out a biotech company, right? So you already have the cure for COVID-19. You just need a little bit of backing and you have already investors who want to give you $10 million to get going, right? A sole proprietor probably wouldn't work for you there. You would want to go more of a corporate form of business. So that, that's why it depends. You know, you look at what you want to do and then you, you go from there. One of the things I was telling Audra when we spoke earlier today is as a rule of thumb, you typically don't want to put real estate into a corporate form of business. Reason why is when you have it in an LLC that's, that's uh, disregarded, which is what you would call like your sole proprietor, you can move the, the property in and out of the LLC and it doesn't really create a, um, a tax implication. But once the LLC goes to an S corp or a C corp, then there is a tax implication of moving that property in and out. So that's one of the reasons why you wanna be careful about what type of business you're running, what type of entities you're choosing to, to um, set up. And it's usually a good conversation between your accountant and your attorney to help you understand what's the tax implications as well as the legal implications of having each type of um, business one. And you hit on the, some of the magic words. So when we were talking yesterday, one of the acronyms that the Rhode Island Small Business Development Center says is when I'm really getting ready to, to formally launch a business, I want to make sure I have bail, the bank, the accountant, the insurance, and the lawyer. And we had a great question about how do I find good ones? Good ones, and specifically started with accountant. Um, is there is there something I can ask for? How can I find a, a strong person who's going to really help me build that business and give me really helpful advice? Yep, I would say, especially in, in, in today's day, you can use Google reviews as a good point for you to see what, what other people are saying about that accountant. Um, I would also go to people who you trust Maybe you have a close friend that already has a business and has an accountant. You, you know, talk to them about what the relationship is like. And when we spoke earlier, I was telling you that normally no one sees your taxes unless you're going to purchase a property, you know, right? Or unless you got to go for lending for the business. So it's a good opportunity for you to really talk to, to the person who you're asking for a recommendation to really get into the weeds and ask them, you know, are they able to answer your questions? What kind of um, ideas are they proposing that are helping your business? And things like that for you to say, all right, you know what, this person sounds like they're able to, um, to help me. Now let me start by having a quick meeting with them to ask them some questions to see if I can, you know, get a good feel for them. And if, and if you feel it's a good fit, you know, because as an accountant, you want to make sure you're taking on a client that's a good fit for you. And you as the client want to make sure you're interviewing an accountant that's going to be able to handle your business. Also, keep in mind that depending on where your business is in the stage, there's going to be a different accounting in a firm for each business type, right? So, for example, if you start out as a sole proprietor and then your business continues to grow to the point that you need to go public, you're not going to be able to have the same person do that from A to Z. And it's okay for you to outgrow the person that you have now and then go on to a bigger firm who can help you once you become more of a regional and multinational company if it gets to that point. And I appreciate a couple of things. One is, yeah, here's the reality. We, just like anything that grows and develops, it changes, we're going to have different experts. I also really appreciate what Diego said, which was on both ends, like you want to make sure the professional whether this is an accountant or lawyer, is really the right fit for you. But they do on the other side too. Um, and I think that that's a really good reflection to have on it. We do have a question and it's, what is the difference between S and C Corp? All right, um, the major differences are, and the S and the C is, is a subchapter in the Internal Revenue Code. But the, the major difference is, is the number of shareholders. So a Nest Corporation is limited to 100 shareholders. Um, the definition of shareholder is not a person, um, but 100 shareholders, they have to be US persons. So like it's, it's limited to um, 
U.S. residents and uh, citizens. Um, and then you can have U.S. corporations as well. Um, and then so you have the, the shareholders, the, um, and then the taxation as well. So when you, when you have an S corporation, it's a flow through entity. So what that means is similar to a partnership, you're going to report out, here's all the income and the expenses. And this is what each shareholder received in the form of a K-1, which you bring into your personal tax return and you pay the taxes there. Whereas C corporation, um, basically reports income and expenses, and then they pay as of right now, a flat 21% tax rate. And then the, um, the distribution to the owners in the form of dividend get taxed again, anywhere between zero to um, 23.8 if you're in the highest bracket. So from a tax perspective, that's, that's the major difference between the two. And I think these are some of the areas, depending on what your, you know, depending on what your, your skill set is. If you're someone like Diego, you might say, okay, this is where I get in gritty and, and I really feel comfortable moving and making these decisions because taxation and the finance is his strength. But if you're somebody else who says, listen, I'm, I'm really on this other end of talents, this, this is intimidating. We're talking about access and this is intimidating. I think this is where we go back to, this is, these are the conversations you have with professionals. So the thing you need to know is there are different structures and each one has its pros and cons. But if you have a clear idea of how you want the business to operate today and potentially grow, you can have a really good conversation. And one of, <clears throat> one of the comments that Diego had made when we spoke earlier was, yeah, you look at professionals and you go, okay, if I speak to an accountant or I have someone help me out, it's gonna cost me 150 or $200 to just have this starting conversation. Gee, that's a lot of money. And what he and I were talking about is there's also a lot of money that's saved. If I do not do it the right way, this is stuff that can come back to me just by not making the right decisions, not understanding the tax, how much I'm going to be paying in taxes for one versus another. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. And also, even though you're just starting, you want to think about the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? So, for example, if your end game is to create a business that you want to sell to someone else, there may actually be a scenario where C Corp is more beneficial because you get the exclusion of the small business stock that um, you're able to exclude a certain amount of gain from paying taxes, where the other um, entity types don't have. So that's why you kind of want to get a good feel for what the holistic picture is. Also, when you go from being an employee to a business owner, you know, you're used to paying filing your taxes, which is normally your federal and your state income tax return. Now, as a business owner, especially in the state of Rhode Island, and that's a good, that will be a good thing on the business structure and the last bullet point, the um, SOSRI.gov um, link for you to check out. Because if you have an LLC in Rhode Island, you have to pay every year $400 to have that entity open and registered. You know, a lot of times people are not aware of that until it's time to file the taxes and they're like, oh, what's this voucher? I didn't make any money. Why am I paying $400? And that's where you learn about the corporate minimum tax. On top of the fact that you have to pay $50 per year to be registered with the Secretary of State. So those are things that by having a simple conversation, you can tell someone, well, why don't you start out as a sole proprietor, see where the business goes, and then if you need to um, incorporate, you can do that later on, right? Or for example, if you wanna, if we meet on December 1st and you don't really have anything going on over the next 30 days, your business is really gonna start in January. It may be something as simple as say, why don't you wait until January to register your LLC so that you don't pay the $400? Because if you register on December 31st, you still have to pay the $400 for the, for the year. So those are little things that can save you more than what you're gonna spend you know, over time when you have an LLC that you're not really using, but you're paying 400 bucks per year to have open. Thank you. Let's talk about you. <laughs> so Diego, Blue Rod Financial Group, LLC. Couple of notes here, founded in 2015, specializing in accounting, bookkeeping, small business, individual taxes, 
the thing I really liked is when Diego and I were talking about it, and I liked it because I, I think of him as being somebody who's really strong in numbers. And his comment was, he found a formula that worked for his life. And just the thinking of it being in a formula to me resonated. It was perfect, perfect kind of quote from him. But talking about the reason for starting your business of, I get to have the balance that I want. Tell us more. Why did you start your business? Well, I quickly found out that no matter what you do, you're always going to work a lot of hours. And what I kind of looked at it said, all right, well, once you're working, right, and you have your career, you basically have a salary that's, that spends over 40 hours a week. So every additional hour that you work and you want to be committed and do a good job means that your hourly rate is actually diminishing. So, you know, when you have month end, when you have a, a financial forecast that you're working on and things like that, you are basically, you put in your 50 hours a week and now you said, all right, instead of me making 40 bucks an hour, I really made 36 bucks an hour because the extra hours that weren't taken into account. And I kind of said, well, you know, I would rather um, work less and be happy with what I earn, or I'll continue to work and work my butt off, but I'll be able to earn more money because I won't be capped at, at, the, at the salary that I got at work. So that's kind of was the, the, the thought, my, the, the frame of mind that I had when I started making the decision of, you know, life, work life balance, having that control, and then basically saying, I want to be able to work smarter so I can take more time off and that I don't have to wait until I retire to be able to enjoy life. That, that was the formula that I came up with and it's worked well so far. And I like the, um, one of the things we talk about, or I often talk about in advising with people is when they're going and kind of weighing in between jobs and they say, you know, this one from the beginning pays a lot better. And then you break down what Diego did and said, okay, it pays a lot better, but you're going into a 60 hour work week. So it pays 25% more than the one that has a 40 hour work week. But if I do the math and I break this out into hourly, I take home more, but I have less hourly versus I could work a 40 hour work week and I could choose whether to get a second job, whether to start my own venture, what to do on the side. Um, and I think that's a really important reflection on, there's so many components that go into you as an employee, whether you are the business owner and the employee or you're working for somebody else. Yeah, and then you also ask yourself the question, right? When you decide that you're gonna move on and they, come back and says, well, we'll give you X amount to stay. You know, that is a good idea to take it at first, but after a month or two, it wears off and you're back to where you started. So then you have to ask yourself, did I make the right choice? And that's why it's good to, uh, to look at it holistically, like you said. So what, are your, what do your services look like? How do you do business? Well, so I do business actually before the COVID happened, is a combination of in-person and virtual. And I like the virtual side and so do the client because you're able to um, basically from your computer, wherever you're, you're at, log into like a Zoom meeting or, or WebEx like we're doing today, be able to, um, to take care of whatever business we have to go over. And then you can log out and take and continue about your day. I noticed that with the in-person, because you have to get up, drive to where we're going to meet, and then have our meeting, you want to stay there longer because you want to get your, your time's worth. You know, you said, I already disrupted my day to come here. I might as well stay here for an hour versus having a quick, maybe 15 minute call over Zoom and accomplish the same thing. So that's why I like the virtual. I also like pre recorded stuff. So, like, almost like you're doing with this webcast where you're recording it. It gives the person the ability to say, maybe I didn't capture everything, but you're able to go back and rewatch the things that didn't make sense to you. And then you can also watch it at your leisure. So if you're an early riser, you can watch it first thing in the morning. If you're, you know, if you go to sleep late, you can watch it late at night, but you're still able to access the information without having to break your day for it. And I appreciate that because I think when we are talking about customer service and how can I meet my client where they're at, just the fact of maybe I'm a morning person, maybe I'm a night person, 
And, you know, I, I don't know about other people, but a lot of times with finances, I think there's an emotional barrier for people. I think finances make us really nervous. So if I know that I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be already kind of jittery and unsure, and then I'm going to wa- or have to talk and it might, I might not be at my best. So if I have the chance to do things on my own time with my own schedule, then I can really take the information in and digest it and ask you better questions. Yeah, and then also, you know, down the road, if you kind of like forgot, you know, you're like, what was it he told me about this? You can always go back and, and rewatch it and you can, you know, get up to speed at a time that's convenient for you. Now, when we were talking before, you began with an emergency plan. So from the time of, of setting up your business, why? I, I started because living here in New England, you know, our winters can be harsh. And, you know, there's years that we have winters and we're like, was it really winter? And there's other years, I think it was in 2014 or 15, where it just wouldn't stop snowing. And I think it was in Massachusetts, they had like no place to put the snow. So when we have like those situations, right, you want to be able to continue to, to run your business, especially if, um, if we're having blizzards during tax season, you know, or this year we had COVID during tax season. You can't just say we're not going to continue working. You know, you have to find ways to to make it work in a way that works for both sides. So in one of my backgrounds, I worked for emergency management. I worked for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And we talked about this a lot. And what we found were, you know, we knew, and I'm sure anyone who's worked in emergency management or in an organization or agency that deals with emergencies, it was very well understood that at some point, whether this is a, a cyber situation, whether this is weather related or the idea of some sort of influenza, these things have been known. We, we know that we could be facing 50% of the workforce or systems that are down. But I think where the strength is, is you actually thought about it and established it. And, and this is the breaking point. A lot of people talk about it, but don't have a plan in place if something happens to a key supplier. So not even thinking about me as just me and my own business, but all the other businesses that I touch in order to deliver services to my clients. Yeah, no, you bring up a good point. And also like uh, a background that I have was internal audit with Covidian. Um, When I was working there, I would go out to the plant sites and I would see that we have like 200 uh, vendors validated for raw materials but we're only using like 15 of them. And I'm like, so what do we have all those other ones? And they're like, back them, you know? So what they'll do is they'll order a very, very small amount just to continue to, to use the product in case the major supplier backfire, you know, or couldn't do the work, they're able to quickly replace without having to stop production. And so that's also part of the, the way that I also learned to do the emergency plan. And it's not thinking about remote stuff, right? So What's the likelihood in Rhode Island to get an earthquake? It's very remote. I'm not going to have a contingency plan for an earthquake, but I am going to have one for like power outages. I lost power this morning because a transformer down the street blew up. So it's like little things like that, that I'm not going to go buy a generator, but maybe having like a, a APC unit, you know, so that you can be able to save the important things and shut down for temporary uh, power outages. And then for more permanent, you come up with a with a plan of maybe using a virtual office where you can work rent space per hour. But those are the things that you want to just plan for the most common things that can happen and then hope that they hold out for catastrophe. Which in my experience for this COVID, you know, I didn't have to do anything different. So what I had in place worked well. So what are what's next for your business? Are you I'm doing great the way I am. Do you have any plans to change services or grow in a different direction? Well, it, it's funny that you say that because I, one of the things that I like to do when we spoke is, you know, when, when you have experiences with clients, both positive and negative, that's like when you take the time to reflect, to say, all right, what am I doing well and what can I do better? 
and thinking about what are the services that I'm offering and then what are the services that are most solicited as well to say, am I really meeting the needs uh, of the community that I'm serving? And so for me, what's next, I think is starting to build out a team that I feel confident in that can continue to do the, you know, I would want to hire people who are smarter than me because I don't want to be the smartest person here. I want to be able to um, use the, the knowledge and experience of other people around me as well. And I want to say that, you know, continue the, the level of um, quality control, but, but still having like a diverse team that can help, you know, take the burden of one person. So I appreciate what you said about the reflection, because I think when we were talking before, that was a big piece of an internal audit. So this kind of, hey, what are my logistics? But there's that, what are my internal logistics? So can we go through these? And we talked a little bit about the financial responsibilities of, I really wanna, I really wanna touch base and have an expert that says, let's walk through and make sure we're in the right structure. Besides filing taxes, are there any other financial responsibilities that I have as a business owner? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like the way that I look at filing taxes is like you basically passing or failing a class, you know, um, at, at URI. You don't fail or pass on the last day of class. It's a culmination of all the work that you do throughout the semester. So when you think about a business, right, all the decisions that you're making from January to December is what's going to determine how much tax you owe at the end of the year. So you want to be able to keep up with estimated tax payments so that you don't have to come up with a big balloon payment, you know, come April 15th. You also want to um, do your, your forward looking things. Like, for example, um, am I able to meet with the demand of customers? So looking out, for example, What's the health of the business? You know, those are the kind of things that you do throughout the year so that um, you're able to maximize the taxes at the end of the year. So am I in an in a entity type that's maximizing the taxes for the way that I'm operating today? If you're an S corporation, am I paying myself the wages that I need to pay in order to pay the, the reasonable compensation that's required? You know. I, am I contributing to a 401k? Those are the things that we look at more throughout the year to make sure that the goals of the business are being met and then the taxes is just the, the end of it. And that's a really good point because just like when we talked about the salary and how much am I making hourly versus that 40 hour or that 60 hour work week, you know, I think it's very easy when you start a business to say, I'm looking at straight income but not taking in effect, am I making that investment? How, like, just like I would if I was working for someone else, I would wanna know about those packages. I need to be building that into my business too. Correct. What do I need to report on? And when you say report, can you? Yes, yeah, so like I'm thinking what we were talking about, you know, filing taxes and we were talking about, um, you would have to file uh, the business the the business notes from like your annual meeting. Any other big financial, and we'll stick to your area of expertise, which is the financial side. Any other big financial pieces that I need to be prepared to report on? So I would say the two big ones are going to be your state and your federal tax returns. Then from there, if you are depending on the state that you're registering, you have to pay your annual corporate minimum tax as well. Some states roll it into your secretary of state filing. Other states like Rhode Island make you file a separate tax return, um, a 1065 for your LLCs to collect the $400. If you're in the retail space, you have to do monthly your sales tax filing. Okay. And then annually, you have to do your sales tax reconciliation. You also have your tangible tax filing with the city that you're incorporated in. Um, the, if, you're, if you have payroll, you have your quarterly you know, payroll filings, and then you have your annual payroll filings, what we refer to as your 940, 941s. And then you have to issue your W-2s. If you pay contractors, your 1099s. There's a lot of things that are going on, but uh, there's, there's definitely a lot to report. Um, and having a good system, like, you know, like a, a QuickBooks is a good place for you to track 
all the all the metrics that you need so that when you have to, for example, pay your, your monthly sales tax, you're able to see how much did I sell, how much of that was um, taxable sales. So you can immediately get that calculated and paid out. Um, same thing for, your, you know, if you have a, a third party payroll provider, they're, they're keeping track of all your wages and withholding and they're remitting that on your behalf and they file the, the, nine, the, the quarterly tax returns for you as well. So you can get help from, from third parties, but definitely having a, a system is, is a huge, huge help in being organized and being able to see the health in the, in the finance of the business as well. So it sounds like we go back to that. I need an accountant and I want a good one and I want to have somebody where I can have some open conversations and that can really save me money in the long run by making sure I'm establishing things the right way. Yeah, and you know what was tricky is, right? So work in this space, you don't necessarily have to be a CPA, unfortunately. So for example, like for you to file taxes, all you really have to do is get a prepared tax ID number and off you go, you can file taxes. That doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified or you're, you're suited for it, it just means that you can do it. And, and that's kind of where you go back to, um, to really looking at the people that you know that are successful and seeing who they're using, why they're using them, what, they, what are they getting out of that relationship? So that when you go to find your person, you gotta find the same thing. So as a CPA, yeah, I'm gonna say you wanna use a CPA, but the, the reason why is because just the level of knowledge is much higher than, than not CPAs. And for the most part, the CPAs that I know are pretty upfront about saying, you know, yes, we can do this. No, we can't do this. And if we can't, are able to at least point you in the right direction of who can help you. Because a lot of times people say, they, I, I see two ends of the spectrum. I have people who call me for every single decision they want to make. And I have people that I don't hear from at all. And I think both sides are not healthy. Because for example, like if you want to, um, if, if you have a legal question, I can't answer the legal question. You know, I can tell you, look, here's the tax ramifications, but you have to consult with your attorney because the attorney is going to be able to answer the question. So we're kind of like the quarterback who can also help point you to where you need to go to get the right answer as well. So what's one thing in your experience, what's one thing, a skill set or a piece of knowledge that I could develop that would really help me succeed in starting a business? I think understanding financial statements, like in, in studying in the, all of them, I would focus more on your profit and loss and cash flow. Profit and loss, because you need to know, right? How much money did I make? What's my profit margin on the products that I'm selling or on the service that I'm providing? Because you can't sell your services or your product at a cost that's, that's lower or at a price that's lower than what it's costing. And sometimes when you're not looking at that on a regular basis, you do sight of it. It's easier with tangible products to price it right. Sometimes with services, not so much. So if you're constantly looking at your profit and loss, you have an idea of what margin you're operating at and is it good or not. And then also you can look at your, um, your expenses. You know, oftentimes people wait until things get tough to cut costs. You kind of want to be doing that on a regular basis anyway. You know, it, and one of the things that I like to do is I take a profit and loss statement and QuickBooks lets you lay it out by month. So you can see January to December. And there, you know, you can kind of see the trends that you can do. Well, why this month did these expenses go up so much? Why did income drop so much? And it's able to have a conversation. They can explain it to you. But a lot of times you, you pick up on a couple of things that you can implement and, and help your business. So for me, I think reading financial statements is, is the best thing that you can do. So we have a really good question and it's about pricing. So say I am somebody who I, the service I am selling, my business is my knowledge. I'm a CPA or I'm a resume writer or it's, it's something or I'm a, a counselor or advisor. It's, it's my knowledge base. How do I figure out the appropriate price for myself and my services? 
That's a very good question. Because even among CPAs, prices are all over the place, right? You have some that are, are much higher, others are much lower. And you kind of ask yourself, well, what it, you know, what is the best way? I um I've been reading a lot about something called value pricing. And when you do value pricing, you take a service and you bring it back to um to a product. And, and by that I mean is, you know, a lot of times people get scared um when you say, I'm gonna charge you 200 bucks an hour. Well, how many hours? I don't know. You know, so what you try to do is you say, look, from my experience, this type of work takes these number of hours, right? So you take your rate, you multiply it by the hour, and now you have a fixed cost. That is a lot easier, right? Because when you go, when you go buy this pen, you're not saying, well, you know, um, we had to hire a new person. They were a little bit slower than, than what we normally do. So our pens are normally $3, but this one's going to be three fifty dollars because of that slow person, you know? So you want to bring it back to a tangible product cost like you do with like an iPhone iPhone is always the same price, whether you go on a Monday or a Friday. So that's kind of what I try to do is use the, the, um, the hourly rate with a standard rate, to, I mean, standard time to come up with what I would think is, is the value pricing. And also pricing it at a, at a point where the person is not going to say, oh my God, you're insane. But also, you don't want to price it so low that I say it's X dollars and you're like, you're jumping on it. Like, I want it. You know what I mean? So it's also that that's the, the other thing is trying to price it, you know, just right. So for the internal part, we had talked before and you had, I had written down a bunch of great notes from you. And some of what you were talking about was, all right, now I'm starting my business, but the, the internal, the motivation that really having a plan and sticking to it, not letting others get in your head and distract you or, or really um, deter you from starting it. If it's something I'm, I'm no. And the one I really liked was you had said, you know, some of the best advice you had ever received was when you're unhappy, write it down, then revisit what you wrote when you need the motivation. Yes. So the, the have a plan and stick to it, you know, the business plan is something that people think about, oh, when I got to go to the bank to get a loan, and they ask me for a business plan. But the, it's a lot more than that. You know, I think the business plan is more of your roadmap of why did I start my business? What do I, um, what, the, what are my goals? What's my vision and mission? Going back to the pricing question, you've done some sort of analysis to determine for the type of service that I'm providing in this um, geography, the going rate or the market rate or what I think is worth is this amount of money, right? Um, and, and that's what's gonna help you stay focused, right? Because when you start a business, everybody who doesn't have a business has an opinion about your business. And it's one thing if somebody in the same space as you gives you some advice, that you can look at objectively and say that's constructive advice that you take it. And there's others where you have those people who just really sit there and try to give you everything that could go wrong with the business that you wanna do when you only wanna hear positive thoughts, right? Now, that's kind of where the business plan goes into effect, right? Because when you're hearing that, the Debbie Downer telling you, don't do this, don't do that, da da da. You can go back to your plan and say, but wait a minute, I address all these things and I have an answer for them all. You know, so so they in essence prepare you to be stronger instead of talking you out of the business idea. And then the reason why you want to write it down when you're unhappy is because when you start a business, especially this or being a business owner in general, is a lot of sacrifice. You know, you have those people who support you in a good way and those who want to um, don't want to see you succeed, unfortunately. You have um, good interactions with clients. You have not so good interactions. And what you can do is when you write down what happened and how it made you feel, what it, what it does is it helps you make decisions to prevent that from happening in the future, right? So for example, like if, if you have a, um, if you do a tax return for a client and, and you did everything correct, 
but the IRS randomly chose them for identity verification process. Well, is that your fault? Not really, you know, right? Because the social security was correct, you know, the name was correct. But then if you don't have that written down in the engagement letter, you know, you may be thinking, well, I don't have to call the IRS and you have that's their responsibility. But the client is saying, well, I already paid you. You should you should be responsible for it. So that's where you can say, right, you know, this time I'll I'll be responsible for it going forward. Let me put something in the engagement letter that says, what am I responsible for? What are you responsible for? So that you don't have those things repeated over and over. That's kind of what, what I mean by that as well. Great. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think a lot of people have talked about those lessons learned, but if I document it and I can go back to it, then it kind of helps stick in my head a little bit more. Yeah, don't um, rate the person who upset you down because you don't want to be mad at them. You just want a situation <laughs> so you can correct it. So we talked, a, we I might have hit a, quite a few things. When we're talking about when do I need an emergency plan, you had said, you know, this is something that's really good from the beginning, just to make sure there's that continuity of service. And what should I consider when creating a plan? I appreciate what you said, which was, what are the most likely scenarios? I can't plan for everything, but you know, based on your region and based on how you do business, what's most likely to happen. Who do I need to communicate my plan to? Those impacted and to keep the the communication simple, I would only communicate how they're like like their piece of the plan. So for example, um in a situation where like my office was closed due to the COVID. So I communicated to the clients, all right, we're still operational. Here's the link to the client portal. Here's how we can schedule Zoom meetings so they understand how they can continue to stay in contact with me, even though we can't do it personally, right? I'm not gonna tell them, oh, you know, I have this remote um, cloud server where I have my, my program, so I'm able to, because they don't really care about that, right? They just care that I'm, they're gonna give me documents, I'm gonna give them a tax return. Now, internally, right, I do have a couple of people who help me. So for them, I show them, all right, if you're not able to come into the office and you're not able to take your laptop home, here are the things that you can do to act to install the server on your computer if necessary. You know, so like so the, the instructions of how do you get access to your key programs, right? Now, if, if it's not cloud-based, if it's if it's um uh what you would call it, um, if it's installed on a local computer, then there you would say, all right, you know, maybe we'll take turns every Friday, somebody different takes home a laptop over the weekend in case there's a snowstorm or something, you know, that person can continue to operate, things like that. And are there any resources that you have found that are helpful when I'm building a plan? So whether these are, hey, this site was really good just to say, you know, let me kind of analyze what's most likely to happen or something else that was, here's a, you know, very basic lean, business plan that I that tells me, you know, think about these categories of operation. So what I do is like every time that I'm going to sign up for a new tool, like, so once I first find the need for it, then the next step that I look for is, well, how is it offered? If it's only offered, like I look at all the different variations of the same tool, because fortunately there's, there's more than one tax software provider, there's one more, more than one cloud um hosting provider so because there's always multiple of the of the same thing you know, gmail versus outlook i always look at the different service providers and see what's the pros and cons and which one give me the ability to to come up with to use it in my contingency plan or how would i integrate this technology into the contingency plan and some things don't necessarily need to be um integrated so for example like i got a desk phone here because I'm able to take the phone calls, the calls from my cell phone, I don't have to have a contingency plan for my desk. It's fine to leave it out. So what financial consideration should I plan for? And what I mean with this one is, you know, should I always have X number of months of savings to cover business? Or do I always, should I always have kind of some, a certain thing on retainer, whether that is, 
a person who is the professional or whether that I, I already know I could start up with a different system. Is there anything that while I'm doing my emergency plans, I should strive for for financially? Well, so financially, and I think in general, like even just like starting a business, if you plan on leaving your job, you should have more than enough money saved up for you to be able to run the business as well as cover your personal expenses. What I would say, especially early on, keep it lean. So for example, like I would rather focus on if I'm selling a product, perhaps maybe doing a drop shipment scenario versus having a ton of money tied up in inventory that I don't know how fast I'm gonna be able to move it. Now, once you have a steady stream of sales, then you can talk about bringing on um, like carrying inventory. But that's definitely a, a thing to take into account is for the business that you're gonna run, what's gonna need the most financial resources and how can I defer that commitment as much as possible until I'm making money so that I'm not having to constantly go into my pocket to fund the operations of the business or have to go out and borrow money and things like that. Like the, 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 the contingency of last resort that you want to, um, to use. And I really appreciate that comment because the thought of when we talk about accessibility again, well, you know, maybe a big startup cost is not possible, but there are companies I can work with that I can design or sell a product within their site, but it, it only, I don't have a cost with it. They will take a percentage of what is sold, but I'm not, I don't have my, my garage filled with t-shirts or mugs or something. And, um, I think that's, that's a really good point. You know, there's always that, that, okay, well, there's, they're taking a bigger profit, but they're taking the risk too. And as my business grows and I prove myself and I start really, you know, go, getting over the learning curve, cause we're all going to have it at that point, I can restructure and I can do something in a different way that allow me a higher, higher profit, but I'll take on more risk. Correct. Yeah. And that's why like the businesses that are, that are more like. Um, services, right? Especially if it's using your knowledge, are the easiest ones to start because it doesn't cost you anything to use your head. So it, it's a lot easier for you to um, to get tools like using Zoom, right? Which has a very low monthly membership cost, um, and having a, a simple website built and and you're off and up and running, right? Um, you can do so if you're not talking about very confidential stuff. You can meet in coffee shops. There are places that rent you a conference room for the hour if you need to have like a more professional setting. So that I, my advice is that is look for all the things that, you, that can provide you flexibility for you to be able to get up and running and not have fixed costs. Because if you need to step away from it, you don't have to pay money to break leases and things like that. But also the, the flexibility allows you to be able to grow in a way that that goes with the pace of your business and, and that's very important because a lot of times we get very um excited about starting a business and we go out and we cooperate and we buy this and we buy that before you know it you probably charge up a credit card and you use up all your funds and you still don't have a uh, you're not offering your services yet so you're not really bringing money in the door so we are doing great on time this is our last slide and um, we have six minutes left. Please, thank you all for the questions you've provided. Use chat, use Q&A. These are my final questions, but I will prioritize yours. Um, we talked a little bit about how you communicate with clients. So it's a combination of in the office, but also virtually videos, kind of checking in with them, it seems regularly. Other comments on how you communicate with your client base? Well, I also have um, a virtual assistant as well, who's able to to take care of all the phone calls that come in as well. And she's really good with um, helping clients access the portal. Because one of the things that we do is we store all of the um, documents on the client portal, because oftentimes, you know, people might be somewhere where they need their child's social security number to be able to fill out an application. 
And instead of having to run back home or call us to give you the information, we also do communication through the portal because we find that that's a place where it's easy to access and convenient for, for everyone. And who is your support team? Support team? Um, so in the business, I have um, two accountants that, that support me with my virtual assistant. But outside of that, I think the more of the support team, you know, I have my, my family who, who supports me. I have two CPAs that I'm good friends with um, that are out of state. So one in North Carolina, the other one in New York. So we have um, touch points every other week where we talk about what are the pain points that we're having as business owners. And also if we're stuck on something, you know, the others shed light on how to um, to help get over, over that burden. And, if you're able to find professionals in your field outside of your market where you're competing, that's one of the best ways for you to be able to learn from their experience without you having to go through it yourself. And I find that to be very valuable. That That's definitely one of the themes we've seen. And some of it has been, you know, things like a mentor where I have somebody where, you know, the professional relationship, they've, they've already done whatever it is but want to advise, or there was another one that was, there's so many um, president and, and young leader groups and entrepreneurship groups. What you said about, I have two people, the three of us are a team, but we're not competing. We're a whole different regions. So this isn't an issue of overlap. However, we can all kind of invest in each other's success. Exactly, yeah. And that's, I think that's the best part because you know, it would be nice if you can do it locally, but it's, it's too close to home. But, you know, it's a lot of times when you're going through something, you like you think you're the only person that it has ever happened to, you know. And when you start talking to other people who do the same thing that you do, you realize it's a common thing. And it is really helpful because especially in, in this field, it's tough for you to know it all. And when you kind of like are able to, you know, pick up the phone or send somebody a message to say, hey, I'm working on this, you know, S corporation and this doesn't look right, they're able to kind of like, you know, tell you, oh, yeah, that's because of XYZ or something like that. It doesn't replace having to do my own research because I do it um, extensively, but, you know, it's good to have somebody that you can bounce things off of. Well, and I think that goes into the other question of what keeps you motivated. If you have that support team and you have other professionals, I mean, it would be very easy for you to be isolated. What else helps you keep you, helps keep you motivated in your business? Absolutely, because, you know, b before I had this support system, it felt like there was a big mountain that you're constantly going up the mountain. And now it feels like I'm running, you know, on a plane or even downhill sometimes. And I think that's what, what keeps me motivated is seeing like the things that before were daunting and like, oh, how do you do this? And now you're like, you know, it takes you a minute and you're able to do pretty routine. Um, also seeing the growth and the success of the client, you know, someone who came in who had just started a business and after three or four years, you're seeing that the business now has employees, the, the family is being supported for the business and the impact that it's making for its customers. I think that also keeps you motivated because you see the value that you're providing to your clients. So my last question is just for fun. And here, it's a quiz question. We like to do quiz questions in my house. I asked my daughters what I should ask them. They said, whether you wanna be a mermaid or a fairy, but I decided to go with something a little different. So. <laughs> Thank you. One of the questions, or the fun question, one of the questions we like to use. You are given, magically, $100,000 to buy anything you want. You can only buy one item. It has to be a tangible product, so we can't say, like, I'm going to invest in this or I'm going to donate. We're making you, making you make a tight and tough decision. Anything that, if it's a, if it's a $5 product, then the rest just disappears. So one item up to $100,000, what is the thing you would purchase? A Tesla? Ah! Um, I, I'm thinking mainly because all of us over here paying for gas and they have <laughs> these free charging stations all over the place. So like they're getting free gas for, for driving electric. 
So I'm like, this sounds like too good to be true. You know, I really appreciate it because you still, even when giving a fun question, you still have a very practical part <laughs> to it. <laughs> so that is the end of our session today. Um, Diego, thank you so much for joining us. This was a ton of information. I really appreciate revisiting some of the stuff that we just went through too quick last night, um, but also this really good balance of what we should be thinking about that you know there is there are support features in place so this isn't something we have to do on our own but making the investment in that right team is going to save us in the long run yeah and and the last thing that i would say is colonel sanders thought of kentucky fried chicken when he retired and realized he didn't have any money for retirement and it shows you that there's no you're not too old or too young or too this to start a business is you having a finding um, a need in the marketplace or seeing a skill that you have that you can offer to others and you just taking a, a leap of faith on yourself. You know, when you go for an interview and you get hired, a stranger is taking a chance on you based oh. on a piece of paper called a resume. So if a stranger is willing to take a chance on you, why can't you take a chance on yourself and follow your dreams? Thank you, Diego. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.